the materialistic view of the world, which you're calling this one end of the triangle, this one corner, it fundamentally has no, um, it makes no claims about the transcendent spiritual or immaterial world. It just says here, all we need to know about truth is what we can know here through reason, through empirical observation. But the problem is there's huge terrains of human experience around morality and meaning and significance that don't jump out of a material understanding of the world. In fact, if we just went with a purely scientific understanding of humans as animals among other animals, right, we wouldn't have a lot of what we sort of take for granted in terms of moral and political life together. So then you have this recovery, uh, you could call it a reenchantment effort of romanticism without the baggage of Christianity, which has authority, yep. exclusivity, ultimate truth claims, this God, we just want to keep it at the level of the individual and yep. of the self's quest for selfhood or meaning or something like that. So, yeah. So if you take the, that thought and then you uh, put it back <clears throat> in this sort of triangle, if you will, uh, what you see is uh that we wind up with a worldview that is committed to science and a worldview that embraces romanticism and they are in conflict with each other. Mm, Take okay. Christianity out of the picture. They are in conflict with each other. So that's what C.P. Snow observed in 1957. He, he writes this, delivers this lecture on the two cultures. And he says, we've got these literary intellectuals and we've got this natural, these natural science and they don't get along. Mm. There's a mutual gulf between them. They don't understand each other. They don't even like each other. Mm. Uh, and so people heard that lecture, it really resonated. People knew something is going on here, but nobody knew what it was. Mm. No, nobody put their finger on just what it was. They were f forcing kids in the secondary schools and in England to study his two cultures. But what was he really talking about? Mm. And so many people said, well, the answer here is that we just, you know, we need better multidisciplinary education. And if we just could take scientists and teach them literature, uh, and if we could just take literature, you know, people in the humanities and teach them the second law of thermodynamics, which was C.P. Snow's answer, it'll solve <laughs> this problem. Uh, well, what uh, wasn't realized is that it w there was something deeper than that going on. Mm. So at the end of the decade, at the end of the century, Richard Rhodes writes this book about mm. the history of technology in the 20th century. And he says, C.P. Snow observed this difference. And regardless of what you say, I looked for people in the in, who aren't in the technologies to appreciate technology, and I couldn't find them. So, so there's this sort of dichotomy there. So, how do you explain that dichotomy? So, to go back to the scientific worldview, Kant was the one who said, "We live in a world with two kinds of realities. Mm. There's the phenomenal reality, which is the world of the senses, what we feel, see, hear, That's and right. so forth, yeah. taste. We can study that world with science." But there's another realm of reality that extends beyond that. He called it the noumenal reality. Mm. And he said, we don't know if it exists or not. I can't tell you that there's a noumenal reality, but I can't tell you there isn't one. Mm. And for Kant, this was really important because he was trying to deal with the issue of free will. If you live in this totally materialistic world, you find that it can't explain free will. And he wanted an answer for free will. Uh, and so by opening up the possibility of this noumenal reality... Uh, it made it possible to start thinking in terms of of a free will. Well, scientists come along in the next century and they see the possibility of a noumenal reality as a backdoor to let Christianity back into their science, which they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so led by one of the pivotal figures, a guy named Ernst Mach, um, they take the position uh, that if you're going to pursue science, there is no noumenal reality. Mm -hmm. Now they don't, they don't, claim that science proves there's no noumenal reality. They just say that science means there's no noumenal reality. Mm. That morphs. So that becomes the Vienna Circle in the early 19th, early 20th century, morphs into what I would call today this commitment to a scientific worldview, which you can read in Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, or Michael Shermer's The Moral Arc, or Edward O. Wilson, where he talks about consilience, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett. There's just a whole slug of of really thoughtful, intelligent people who buy into this worldview, that's fine. But then they, ex they they morph and they say, and scientists proved there's no noumenal reality. Mm. Science didn't prove there was that. I mean, that's nonsense. All science does is it, it operates in a world where there is material and it makes an assumption that there's no noumenal reality. Mm. And so they basically wipe that whole possibility of a noumenal reality off the charts by just declaring it not to be with no basis other than a philosophical choice to do it. 
Well, so the romantics come along and they're, I mean, if you put it in these terms, the romantics look at the world and they say, wait a minute, <laughs> you've defined a We're world that is something. totally phenomenal. Yeah. And that's not all there is. Mm. There's more to it than that. We don't know what it is. Right. You know, there's something that you aren't grasping about the nature of humanity when you wipe that world out. Right. And so they react to the enlightenment, counter enlightenment, if you will, yeah. by, by claiming that there's more to reality without necessarily defining what it is.